you often hear the phrase, like dissolves like, when you're talking about solubility. And even though this idea isn't perfect, it does allow you to predict the solubility of compounds. For example, a polar solvent will dissolve a polar compound in general, so like dissolves like. I also have here a polar solvent will dissolve an ionic solute because you don't usually describe ionic compounds as being polar. Next, a nonpolar solvent will dissolve a nonpolar compound, so like dissolves like. But a polar solvent will not dissolve a nonpolar compound. So this would be like and unlike here. An example of a polar solvent is water. An example of a nonpolar compound could be something like oil. And we know that water will not dissolve oil. Let's go back to this first idea of a polar solvent being able to dissolve a polar compound, or a polar solvent dissolving an ionic compound like sodium chloride. We know from experience that sodium chloride, or salt, is soluble in water. So over here on the left, we have part of a salt crystal. We know that crystals are held together by attractive forces. The positively charged sodium cation is attracted to the negatively charged chloride anion. So opposite charges attract, and our crystal is held together by these attractive forces. If we get some water molecules to come along, we know that water is a polar solvent. Water is a polar molecule. The oxygen is more electronegative than this hydrogen, so the oxygen pulls some of the electron density in this bond closer to it, giving it a partial negative charge. If we are withdrawing electron density from this hydrogen, this hydrogen gets a partial positive charge. And since opposite charges attract, the partially positive hydrogen on water is attracted to the negatively charged chloride anion. So there's an interaction here. If we get a bunch of water molecules, here's another one right here, so partially negative oxygen, partially positive hydrogen, so there's another attractive force, we can pull off these chloride anions from the solid and bring the anion into solution. So on the right here, we have our chloride anion in, in solution, surrounded by a bunch of water molecules, and we have all, all these partially positive hydrogens interacting with our negatively charged chloride anion. For the sodium cations, let's go back to our solid on the left. Since the sodium cation is positively charged, that's going to interact with the partially negatively charged oxygen in the water molecule. So opposite charges attract, and if you get enough water molecules, you can pull off these sodium cations and bring the sodium cations into solution. So we have the partially negative oxygens on water interacting with our positively charged sodium cations in our solution. So our polar solvent, water, needs to be able to interact with our solutes. And in this case, the polar solvent attacks the solid over here on the left, and it replaces these ion-ion interactions of our crystal with ion-dipole interactions in our solution. And by ion-dipole, I mean we have a cation right here, so that's our ion, and then our dipole would be water. Water is a polar molecule, it has a dipole moment. So we have all of these ion-dipole interactions. So ionic solutes that are able to participate in these interactions and, right, will dissolve in water. If you have a polar compound, right, a similar idea, you have attractive forces that allow the polar compounds to be dissolved in a polar solvent like water. Let's move on to a nonpolar compound. So a nonpolar compound is something like this molecule on the left here, and this molecule is called naphthalene. Naphthalene is a solid with a very distinctive smell to it. So the first time I smelled naphthalene in the lab, it reminded me of my grandparents' house because my grandparents, when I was a kid, had mothballs that were made of naphthalene. So it's a very distinctive smell. Naphthalene is nonpolar because it's composed of only carbons and hydrogens. It's a hydrocarbon. So naphthalene is nonpolar, and you would need a nonpolar solvent to get it to dissolve. Toluene is a nonpolar solvent. Again, this is a hydrocarbon. So if you take solid naphthalene and liquid toluene, uh, naphthalene will dissolve in toluene. So like dissolves like. Our nonpolar solvent will dissolve our nonpolar compound. 
But finally, let's look at this last idea here. So a polar solvent, something like water, should not dissolve a nonpolar compound, something like naphthalene. And that's true, naphthalene will not dissolve in water. So water doesn't interact well enough with the naphthalene molecules to get them to dissolve and form a solution. So this concept of like dissolves like is important because it allows you to predict whether or not a compound will be soluble in water. Let's look at several organic compounds and determine whether or not those compounds are soluble in water. And we'll start with ethanol. Ethanol has a polar oxygen-hydrogen bond. The oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so the oxygen withdraws some electron density, making the oxygen partially negative and leaving the hydrogen partially positive. If water comes along, I'll draw in a water molecule here, and we know that water is a polar solvent. Water is a polar molecule. The oxygen has a partial negative, and the hydrogens have partial positive charges. We can see that there's an opportunity for an attractive force. Opposite charges attract, so the partially positive hydrogen on ethanol is attracted to the partially negatively charged oxygen on water. This is an example of hydrogen bonding. So if you remember hydrogen bonding from earlier videos, here is a good example of that. We could even have some more hydrogen bonding. I could draw in another water molecule down here. So let me go ahead and do that. We know that the oxygen is partially negative. The hydrogens are partially positive. And so here's another opportunity for hydrogen bonding between the partially negative oxygen on ethanol and the partially positive hydrogen on water. So this portion of the ethanol molecule is polar and loves water. So this is the polar region and this portion loves water. We call this hydrophilic. So let me write that down here. So this portion of the molecule is hydrophilic or water loving. Let's look at the other portion of the ethanol molecule. So this portion on the left, we have a CH2 here and a CH3 here. So carbons and hydrogens, which we know are nonpolar. So this region is nonpolar. This region doesn't like water. It's scared of water. We call this hydrophobic or water fearing. So we know that ethanol is soluble in water just by experience. So that must mean that this hydrophobic region doesn't overcome the hydrophilic region. So the hydrophilic region, this polar region of the ethanol molecule, is enough to make ethanol soluble in water. If we think about that same concept and we look at a different molecule, so on the right here's one octanol, one octanol has an opportunity for hydrogen bonding, right? We have this OH here, so it's the same situation as the ethanol on the left. So we have a, a polar or hydrophilic region of the molecule. However, the difference is this time we have extremely large nonpolar hydrophobic portion of the molecule. And this nonpolar region overcomes the slightly polar region, making the one octanol molecule nonpolar overall. So one, oct one octanol will not dissolve in water. So this one is a no, and this one over here was a yes. Ethanol is a yes. Next, let's look at cinnamaldehyde. So down here on the left is cinnamaldehyde. Let's focus in on, let's focus in on this carbon-oxygen double bond first. We know that oxygen is more electronegative than this carbon here, so the oxygen withdraws some electron density, making it partially negative, and this carbon would be therefore partially positive. So this very small portion of the molecule is polar. This small portion could interact with water. However, we have extremely large nonpolar region of the molecule, all these carbons and hydrogens over here on the left. And so this very hydrophobic region, or nonpolar region, overcomes the small polar region, making cinnamaldehyde overall nonpolar. Since it's overall nonpolar, cinnamaldehyde will not dissolve in water. If it's nonpolar, you would need a more nonpolar solvent to get cinnamaldehyde to dissolve. And there are several examples of nonpolar organic solvents that will, that will do that. Next, let's look at sucrose. So over here on the right is sucrose, or one way to draw or represent the sucrose compound. Now we see lots of carbons and hydrogens. So all of these right here, let me just go ahead and highlight all these carbons in this ring. Right? So all, there are all these carbons in these rings, there are all these hydrogens. So you, at first you might think, okay, there's lots of carbons and hydrogens, this might be, be nonpolar. 
But of course we have lots of these OH groups. So um, let me go ahead and circle a few of them, right? We have all of these OH groups in the sucrose molecule, so lots of them. And that means opportunities for hydrogen bonding. And because of all those opportunities for hydrogen bonding, sucrose is soluble in water, which we know from experience, of course, sucrose or sugar, sugar will dissolve in water. So the opportunity for hydrogen bonding is the reason for that. Benzoic acid is a solid at room temperature. And if you take some benzoic acid crystals and you put them in some room temperature water, the crystals won't dissolve. We can explain that by looking at the structure for benzoic acid. While we do have this portion of the compound, which we know is polar and hydrophilic due to the presence of the electronegative oxygens, we also have this portion of the compound on the left, which is nonpolar and hydrophobic due to the presence of all the carbons and hydrogens. And since the benzoic acid crystals don't dissolve at room temperature water, the hydrophobic portion of the compound must overcome the hydrophilic portion of the compound. You actually can get benzoic acid crystals to dissolve in water if you heat up the water, if you increase the solubility of the compound by increasing the temperature of the solvent. But let's think about benzoic acid crystals in room temperature water, and let's add a base. Let's add sodium hydroxide. So the sodium hydroxide is going to react with the most acidic proton on benzoic acid. So benzoic acid is acidic. It will donate this proton right here. And that means the electrons in red in this bond are left behind on the oxygen. So I'll show those electrons in red over here. That gives this oxygen a negative charge. And we form sodium benzoate. So I won't get too much into acid-base chemistry. Uh, but we took the most acidic proton off of benzoic acid to give us the conjugate base sodium benzoate. And sodium benzoate is highly soluble in, in room temperature water. And that must mean we increase this hydrophilic portion because now we have a negative charge. So the hydrophilic portion now is able to overcome the hydrophobic portion. And sodium benzoate is soluble. This negative charge is better able to interact with with our, with our solvent, which is water.